Sounds like a classic summer spot and a classic yeah. summer moment. Now, you said that you got to have ice cream when you're traveling or on an RV trip, but you just have to have ice cream when it's summer. Yeah. Guys, so everybody listening <laughs> so to this good. podcast, you know, it's yeah. summer right now. If you have not been having ice cream, you need to go out and get some ice cream. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of the RV Atlas. Today, I'm excited to have back on the show Carrie Cox from Travels with Birdie and TravelsWithBirdie.com, and she is completing a two-episode series on her huge New Mexico road trip. I think that New Mexico is one of the most underrated states in the country for RV travel, partly because it's far away and a lot of people don't get there. Uh, and Carrie had a magnificent, magnificent road trip. In the episode last week, she covered Santa Fe and a campground that she loved there called Santa Fe Skies. And in this week, she's taking us to Taos, New Mexico, which she equally loved, and to another awesome, awesome privately owned, family owned campground called uh, Taos Montebello. And she loved that campground. She loved the campground in the Santa Fe episode. And she truly, truly loved both cities. So if you put these two together, um, it's a lot of great material if you want to start planning your own big New Mexico road trip. Now, we have done a series over the years on underrated states for RV travel. We've done states like New York, Michigan, Virginia, Oregon, Southern Indiana, not the whole state, but we called Southern Indiana an underrated RV destination. And I would actually love to do uh, another episode in that series on New Mexico, because I think it is one of the most underrated states in the country for RV travel. And Carrie points out on this episode that there were sites available at this wonderful campground she stayed at. So if you're struggling to find sites at some of the most popular national parks or struggling to find sites at Great Smoky Mountains or Yellowstone, maybe consider New Mexico for a summer road trip next year. And I can pretty much guarantee you'll be able to find some awesome campgrounds. Uh, so I'm excited for this episode with Carrie Cox. We're going to come back in a second and get this amazing content from her. But before we do so, we have sponsored messages from our friends at RV SnapPad and from our friends at Blackstone. Hello, Carrie Cox from Travels with Birdie, and welcome back on to the RV Atlas. It is always my pleasure having you back on the show. We love having you for all this epic travel content that you've, you've given us over the years. Are you ready to give us part two of this two-part series on your big New Mexico road trip? Are you ready? I am ready. Super excited to talk about Taos. Exceeded our expectations in all the ways. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. Because I mean, yeah. this was a return trip to New Mexico. And really the mm -hmm. point of it was this leg of the journey, right? The, yeah. the Taos leg of the journey. Um, so before we dive in, you're going to talk about Taos. You're going to talk about the campground you stayed at there. But this is part two of a series. So can you just recap what you covered in the last episode in case anyone missed that and wants to go back first? Sure. So we spent just a couple of days in Santa Fe and um, hit some of the places we didn't hit on our first trip to Santa Fe. We stayed at a different campground, Santa Fe Skies. And in the last episode, I gave an awesome review of that. So um, if you're heading to Santa Fe, you definitely want to check that out to find out about this amazing campground. And we just talked about a few few places to hit up and some restaurants. I'm not always big on the restaurant reviews, but when you're in New Mexico, you're gonna eat good. So <laughs> we and you've got, and you've it. got some you've got some food yeah. recommendations here too for exactly. Taos, right? Uh, and then also too, you did mention the Santa Fe KOA is another option if you want mm -hmm. something maybe more family centric. Or the campground you stayed at last time was maybe a little bit more of a couple's campground to some degree. Sure. Um, so let's dive into Taos. I mean, tell me about this this magnificent city that, as you say, exceeded your expectations. Yeah, so we had just always heard about Taos, I guess, probably, I think maybe in the 80s and 90s, it kind of became a, a hot destination. And um, so it was always in the back of my head as a place to go. I'd heard kind of a, the artsy community, artsy vibe. So that appealed to me. And um, it's only 100 miles from Santa Fe, an hour and a half. But really... I just thought the vibes were totally different. Like they're, they're very similar. They both have the Adobe architecture, a lot of the same, um, you know, artistic culture in both towns, a lot of Native American culture in both towns. But um, Taos was just really laid back, a little bit quirky. And so it was, um, it definitely had a totally different vibe than Santa Fe. So it was not like a waste to move an hour and a half. As you know, like when you decide, should we actually move to this, move our RV to this place? or 
um, just drive up there. It was worth it was worth the drive. It was worth the five days that we spent because we didn't see and do everything that was in town. And for a lot of our viewers, getting to New Mexico is a big deal. It's a big it's a big trip because it's far away for so many of us. So like to do the extra hundred miles, um, it seems like a no brainer to me, right? If you went all the way to New Mexico. Now you did do Albuquerque as well, not this trip, but you've done Albuquerque before. Um, yeah. So if somebody was planning their first RV trip to New Mexico and they were doing a big trip, do, do you have an order of preference? Uh, mm-hmm. would, would you go to one first? Would you recommend one over the other or all three of them something to maybe try to do in one big RV trip? I think if you can split your stay between those three places, um, and then if you're into the national parks, there's a lot of national parks and national monuments out that way. And so if you want to hit kind of the the nature area, you need to look into that. And then one thing we didn't do, we looked at going down to um, White Sands National Park. It was actually five hours from the Taos Santa Fe area. The Great Sand Dunes of Colorado were actually closer. We also considered a day trip there, but ultimately just decided to to, to relax and stay in Taos. So anyway, I definitely think staying in the towns is worthwhile because just of the access. Like these are both places, Santa Fe and Taos and Albuquerque are all places where there's several things, to, several days worth of things to see and do. So on our first trip, we only spent two days in Santa Fe and it was, it was worth going back. There was more, more to see and do. And like I said, this time we spent five days in Taos. Plenty, plenty to do there if you wanted to mix in relaxation, which was important to us. And how about the ride from Santa Fe to Taos? Was it was it pre- pretty easy towing with Birdie? Yeah. So there's two ways you can take between Taos and Santa Fe. Um, one one way is called the high road to Taos, and that's actually a recommended you know like attraction. Take the high road to Taos as a um, beautiful scenic drive. But when we were towing, we took what is called the low road to Taos, which fo- follows the Rio Grande River Valley. A Rio, do you used to say Grand? <laughs> Russell kept correcting me. I think Starbucks has, has me saying Grand Grande. Anyway, uh, <laughs> we took the low road to Taos and um, very easy towing, very fun. I think you could tow on the high road to Taos as well. Um, it wasn't, again, compared to Colorado, it wasn't you know major switchbacks or drop offs or anything. So. Honestly, either was fine, but low road was probably the first. Remind us again, you were just here uh, three in, in June, early July. Yeah. yeah. And what, what were temps like in the daytime and the nighttime? So it was very important to me as a Missourian to get the heck out of Missouri in the summer because it is so hot and so humid. And when I was looking at the weather of Taos, I was a little concerned because I like to go again to Colorado, high elevation and in Taos, we were at like 7,000 feet. So I was worried it was going to be hot um, because the t- daytime temperatures were 80 to 85 degrees most days. If there was um, cloud cover, it might have been in the high 70s, but there's no humidity. So even like when we were out setting up the trailer in the full sun at 85 degrees, like you didn't sweat. <laughs> so it was such a different experience. New Jersey's humid in the summer too, along the yeah. New Jersey shore. And, you know, like 95 degrees usually is accompanied by brutal humidity, which is way more the problem, right? So, right. you know, if you're a new RV owner from the East and you're just starting to think about traveling to the West, you don't have to be as scared of those temperatures as you think yeah. uh, because it's not as humid. Right. So and then over, let, oh, <laughs> no, no, over, you go ahead. Real quick. Overnight, the temperatures dropped into the 40s or 50s. So like the drop off was so steep in the evenings, I would be outside maybe even under a blanket sometimes because it was so um, chilly so quick. And then the next morning, it takes a long time to get to 80. So even if it's going to hit 80, most of your day is still going to be in the 60s or 70s just because that's the midday sun temperature. So highly recommend this area, even in the heat of summer. It's a delightful part of going to places out west at elevation you know, where it is 85, 90 in the daytime. And then you like when we were in Wyoming outside Yellowstone, it dropped to 29 degrees at night. You know, I actually like that. I think that's yeah. kind of like absolutely delightful because it's just great sleeping weather. So so let's dive into Taos. What else do you want to tell us? What are the main attractions? What are the can't miss things when visiting this kind of quirky, artsy New Mexico city? So like Santa Fe, Taos has one of those downtowns, like the plaza, the square, Um, It has a lot of restaurants, galleries, and everything. Um, Again, all the Adobe architecture, very 
um, you just feel like you're in the place when you're there. And it's, it's hard, you know, that's not really like just an attraction, like it really is like the whole town is just a cool place <laughs> to be. So what we liked is the galleries were a little more approachable, a little perkier, maybe than Santa Fe, you know, like, there were things there that I could have bought, like I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't spend several hundred dollars on art, but like it was within the feasibility that I could go into these galleries and, and find fun things to buy. And so um, that's the place to go like you can spend several hours going again and again and seeing different things like it just went on and on and on for blocks it wasn't just this one square blocks and blocks of galleries and restaurants and just it, shops. is taos somewhat more of a middle class city than santa fe where santa fe is 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 wealthier or is that is it just the galleries and the art right. that fall into that pattern that that was the vibe i got like it felt just like a little bit a little bit um, more laid back and a little, little less wealthy, but in a good way, I guess, as someone who's not at that at that level of wealth. Um, so anyway, I I just really liked that relaxed. It just felt very relaxed, and the people that we encountered were so friendly. So um, I was expecting it to be a little more touristy, um, just because it is one of those places that I heard of as a vacation destination. But it really wasn't very I mean I think you can find a fudge shop you can find some t-shirt shops but it wasn't quite as touristy as I expected. all right tell us about the enchanted circle drive that sounds pretty awesome I don't know if anyone can tell that I like mountains like I mean I probably haven't mentioned that <laughs> but um no so when you're in Taos you're looking out at the Sangre de Cristo mountains and of course I wanted to get up in those and see what was in those and so the enchanted circle drive is the way to do it the scenic byway um, I think it's like maybe 80 to 100 miles to do the whole circle. It makes a circle um, up through the mountains and kind of around the biggest peak in the area. And part of the way up, as you're heading up in elevation, it follows the Red River. So very scenic, like one of those places where you're looking out your car window and you see some little waterfalls and the river, mm -hmm. you know, roaring by. So very pretty. And then you get up to Red River, which is 8,600 feet in elevation. So it was a totally different environment than Taos. Like it um, was really cool and chilly up there, even during the day. And you could tell that you were in a different, different, um, you know, ecosystem being at that elevation. Were um, you getting out and stopping and exploring a lot? Or were you kind of just doing the drive and taking in the sights from the truck? Yeah. So we did a little bit of both. So I think there were towns and places, even more places we could have stopped than we did if we... Um, had really researched what it was in all of those places. Um, but you'll go through the towns of um, Red River, which is super cute, kind of reminded me of Estes Park, Colorado. And then there's an area called Angel Fire. We looked at staying at a resort in Angel Fire. Uh, I think it was called the Angel Fire RV Resort. That looks really plush. If you're looking for a plush resort, high-end resort in this area, that's, that's one to put on your list. Um, we didn't take our fishing poles, but totally could have trout fished in the Red River if we'd gotten a pass. And then you go by um, an Eagle Nest Lake, which is a state park. So that's a place where you can get out and paddle if you wanted. We saw, you know, kayakers and bigger boats and fishing. And it has its own little downtown area. So all of these little towns along the way each have their own vibe, their own little downtowns, tons of restaurants along the way. And you could make a full day of it. We did a half day and just um, did a short trail up in Red River along the along the river. So, my, uh, so loved it. So you know, if you're, if somebody's planning, you could do, like you said. I was just about to ask you. You could do a day here if you wanted, and then do a day downtown, and yeah. that could be a pretty nice trip to the area. I, there's more to do, obviously, but you could do it that way. Yeah, and it was just kind of unexpected because, again, I didn't really know how much of that mountain feeling I would get in New Mexico compared to Colorado, where we've gone a lot. And it definitely felt like you, you felt like you're in the mountains, maybe not quite the big um, alpine peaks as um, Colorado had, but definitely had the mountain vibe. It sounds like you, is it fair to say that you, you compare all things to Colorado? <laughs> like that's your, that's I your do. benchmark for, for, you know, yeah. RV travel, camping, great outdoors. Yeah. Um, which yeah. I'm leaving for Colorado tomorrow, for goodness sake. Yes. And I identify you so strongly with Colorado. So did, did, did Mexico live up to your Colorado vibes that you love so much? 
Yes, because see, that was a point of contention in going to New Mexico was like, is this going to be cool enough? Because I didn't want to be hot. I'm very particular about that. And um, yeah, so it, it really did. Like I enjoyed, I enjoyed also seeing a different scenery because we had seen the scenery of Colorado so many times. So it was neat to um, be in the Taos and Santa Fe areas and um, be a little more in the desert environment and just it's just uniquely beautiful in a totally different way, like than Colorado. So definitely, it's the, it, it's the eternal tension for RVers and for travelers. Uh, and I think even more so for RVers. Do you go somewhere new, or do you revisit the places that you love? And you know, life is short. You have to make some hard decisions in that department. Like, I could go to Acadia again and again. I want to go to Olympic again. Like. I think I kind of want to return to places more than I want to go to new places. And I think that Stephanie leans a little bit more towards wanting to go to new places uh, as opposed to returning to places that we've been again and again. It's, it's, it's wonderful to do both, but you just, you can't get everything in and you have to make some of these difficult choices as travelers. But at the end of the day, it's part of the fun and part of the blessing of travel. So um, anything else on Enchanted Circle Drive or do you want to move on to other attractions yeah. in the Taos area? Yeah, definitely think we can move on. So. Right down the road from our campground was the Rio, Rio Grande Gorge Bridge. The Rio and, Grande. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I swear, like language is not my thing. Like I can do lots of things in life. Language, not my thing. Even though I'm an ELA teacher, like cannot, cannot. Anyway, um, this bridge has a 650 foot drop. So like we drove over it and I knew we were going over a, a canyon, but like your eyes really do kind of pop because you're like, whoa, that's even deeper than I expected um so you can park you can walk across the bridge and look down into the gorge and it really is one of the highest like bridges and highways in the united states um over that that deep of a drop so kind of a cool place maybe you know 10 15 minute stop but worth doing um there's also some kind sometimes artisans and vendors set up in the um, visitor center um, parking lot there so a, a must see can you combine that with the Enchanted Circle Drive? Are they in totally different places? Could that be all one sweeping, you know, yeah. day trip? Yeah, you could definitely do that because it would just be maybe a 20, 30 minute route off the route as you're going up to the circle. <laughs> I'm thinking of my geography. Awesome. So now there's a UNESCO World Heritage Site and I those always catch my attention. I think that the whole rainforest is one, or maybe all of Olympic National Park is one, and parts of Great Smoky Mountain National Park are the whole thing. Um, th th those are some exceptional sites. So what do they have near Taos that's a UNESCO World Heritage Site? So they have the Taos Pueblo, and this has been um, continuously inhabited for over a thousand years. So this is still a living Native American um, community, and you are welcome to come in certain days of the week and um, they have areas of shops and vendors and you can you can look around. We noticed um, in reading about it online that they say, you know, no pictures inside because this is like people's real life. You're not here um, just like, uh, you know, like it's it's not a tourist attraction. It, it's a community. It's, it's not a, a selfie place. spot. Right, right. So we ultimately didn't end up going in. We went close to it to look at the outside, but we didn't end up going in. But Lots of people go in and really enjoy it. There's a, um, a tour you can do. And so very looks like a very interesting place to check out. Awesome. And now there's some um, religious history, obviously, in this area. What did you visit? What did you recommend? Um, so we went to check out this. Oh, gosh, another name. San Francisco de Assisi. Please, please. I think you've got mail. it. Okay, you're going to so get send, hate mail. Send the hate mail to me. <laughs> Mission I Church. have mispronounced many things over 800 <laughs> yeah. episodes of podcasting, okay? Yeah. All right. So this church um, in Taos was photographed by Ansel Adams and painted by George O'Keefe. So we were kind of there as much more for the um, artsy aspect of it. And when we got there, we were kind of disappointed because there was all this construction equipment in the way and they were um, reapplying the adobe. Well, it ended up being really interesting because one of the um, people working on it came over and just was talking to us about the whole process and about how um, the workers in the community and church members actually regularly reapply the adobe and kind of was pointing out, you know, like you can see the straw in it and everything. And so he was really giving us that history of the church and the history of the care of the church 
um, which ended up, I think, even being a little more interesting than had we just gotten this nice, clean photo of the church. Like, it was really interesting to hear um, more about its history. And I think it was built maybe in like the 1700s. So um, just, you know, it's a neat old church and it's scenic and um, famous for its connection to the artists who were inspired by it. I love that something that could have been a loss ended up being a win because yeah. you construction can ruin a trip to a, a, any place. And it's hard to tell if there's going to be construction going on when you're traveling, yeah. but I'm glad that you guys got that, that, that education there while you were there. Um, so how about outdoor adventure? If somebody wants to kind of get into the great outdoors and have some fun. Yeah. And we didn't do as much of this again as we had planned, but the wild rivers recreation area was on our list of places to check out that we didn't get to. Um, this is where the Rio Grande and the Red River um, converge. And so there's a lot you can do there, like trails and fishing. And I don't know if you could do paddling there. I know somewhere in the area, I'm not sure which river, you could do whitewater rafting. So if you wanted to get out into the outdoors, there's plenty of places. Uh, Wild Rivers is just one of the ones close to house. And then as I mentioned earlier, there are several national monuments and um, national parks all within a day's drive. We Definitely could drive to Great Sand Dunes as a day trip, just two hours away. And yeah, lots, lots I, of stuff I think people re relocate to places like Colorado and New Mexico because they go there on a trip and they see there's a lifetime of outdoor adventure to be had in the state. And I feel like New Mexico is one of those states where if you love the great outdoors, you could spend your entire life exploring New Mexico. It's a big state with so much to offer. Yeah. Now, we're going to come back in a second, and Carrie's going to talk about the campground that she chose to stay at. And I think she has another rave review here. So she had two big wins on this trip in terms of campgrounds. But before we dive into her campground selection, we have a sponsored message from our friends at Campo Outdoors. Welcome back to the show, everybody. We are here with Carrie Cox from Travels with Birdie online and travelswithbirdie.com and Travels with Birdie on Instagram. You want to make sure you're following her. She's got great photos. It's fun to uh, follow her on all these awesome trips. We are doing part two of her very recent New Mexico road trip with her awesome husband, Russell. This was a cool trip without the kids. They did Santa Fe and found an awesome campground and they did Taos and they found an awesome campground. So, Carrie, where did you stay outside Taos? How close was it? Give us all the details on this campground. Sure. So we uh, moved from Santa Fe to Taos again, just an hour and a half. So I was kind of, you know, a little nervous about what I liked the campground as much. There were there were several good options in Taos. Um, this one came recommended. People in the RV Atlas community on Facebook were good to recommend. So we stayed at Taos Montebello and. Um, it's just 15 minutes from downtown located on a mesa above the city. So you um, kind of feel like you're in this nice open environment. Uh, we were greeted out front by the owner. He is like the nicest guy. Like any reviews you read, you're going to read about the owner of Taos Montebello. Um, he jokes that he and his wife couldn't even spell RV when they decided to start an RV park. But he said they had this land outside of the house. It had beautiful views. And he said they just started talking to RVers and surveying RVers and asking them what they wanted in a campground. And they knew they weren't going to put in like all of the amenities, like a pool and a fancy playground and all of that. But they wanted like, what is it about campsite basically that you want? And so they built these nice, you know, they could have squeezed in a bunch more, but they built nice sized campsites, um, plenty long, and they have full hookup like I said, 70 feet long, 30 to 50 amp hookups, and 43 to $47 a night, which I think is a steal in the Taos area. I, I didn't price hotels, but I know hotels would have been a lot more. And then the resort um, campground that we looked at outside of Angel Fire was going to be like over $100 a night, I think. So definitely an affordable price. There's such a need and a desire and a want for private campgrounds with full hookups that are clean and pretty and reasonably priced. And it seems to me that's your sweet spot over the years. I, you know, we like everything. We do state parks, we do resorts, but, but I like that middle. I want that middle to exist for RVers because then you get the value out of being an RV owner when you can stay somewhere really cool for 43 or 50 bucks a night. Then all of a sudden it's like, yes, I am saving money as an RV owner, uh, uh, you know, instead of staying at one, of, at one of these resorts that cost so much, you know, and, you know, when you, like, I see these resort prices spiking to over $200 a night, particularly in the Northeast, I'm like, 
man, I got to dump my own sewage, you know, when you're charging me this much. So it seems to me that like, this is your campground love language, right? That you find these places that are pretty, that are clean, that are nice. And, you know, I don't want to, you know, spell out your travel philosophy for you, but it seems like you, you pick these places because you're there to travel and see the area and, and not be at the campground all day. Right. 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 And I, whenever I can find the place that has both, that's, that's what I really like best. Like if you have that place that's like, somewhat like a national park or state park and scenery, but has hookups, like I really like my hookups. Like um, we, we probably could live without, well, we, we can live without water and sewer, but for me, we don't have um, solar or anything. So electric, I, I like my phone. I like being, we leave our kids at home. So a lot of times we definitely need that phone. So Finding that place that has the views and hookups um, is is my favorite. And this hookups one, are yeah. full hookups are <laughs> awesome. I mean, yeah. it's, there's nothing wrong with saying that. I mean, there's been this huge movement in the RV space for people who want to boondock and people who want to do harvest hosts and people who you know, want to camp off the grid. But you know, look, it does require a lot of investment and a lot of money to get the equipment yeah. to then go camp for free or yeah. to go camp in those places that are way less expensive. So I think a lot of people, you know, overplay their hand on that. Like, oh, you know, I'm camping for free or I'm camping on BLM land. Well, how much did you spend on your solar <laughs> setup? You know, it's yeah. not it's not cheap. I mean, it'll become right. cheaper. So yeah. I'm with you. I love these these types of campgrounds yeah. and I love it when the mom and pop are there running it. Um, so, so what else did you want to tell us about yeah. this really cool option? here yeah so i know in the last episode when we talked about santa fe skies i described the views like it's in the name santa fe skies so taos montebello it's also in the name beautiful place right and so as i mentioned it's on the mesa and you have this view of the sangre de cristo mountains all around you and it has like even more phenomenal sunsets than santa fe skies i mean i guess it's not a sunset competition (laughs) but this place you're not looking out on a lot of development it's just um, there's a lot of fields around you so you have that that just broad view and so again naturally naturally beautiful just a very relaxing cool environment and they have a nice walking trail so they don't have it like I said a ton of other amenities but there's a one mile walking loop out through um, the field. So if you have pets, that's a great place to walk. They had a very nice pavilion. There was a um, organized group having a, you know, having a um, gathering there when we were there. The only thing to caution, there are limited bathroom and laundries. There was only like one uh, male, one female shower, and then um, one washer. So, but when we were there, it wasn't overly full. So I think even if you are using their, you know, comfort station amenities, you're going to have pretty easy access. You may just have to wait a few minutes for someone else to finish up. So you could spawn, you know, be spontaneous maybe and get a site at a place like this. That's another thing. You know, that story has been right. beaten to death that nobody can get sites anywhere. But you're saying, you know, New Mexico is pretty far out there, but you're saying like if somebody wanted to plan a last second summer trip, they might be able to get into a place like this. Yeah, there is usually at least a handful of spots every night that we were there. Um, and I think we were there over one of the weekends. So I, I, yeah, for sure. And it didn't even fill up then. So did, did Santa Fe skies also, did, was that a capacity or did you feel like there were some open sites there? This really interests yeah. me a lot. Actually, I'm, I'm very curious whether yeah. places are selling out or not this summer. Santa Fe skies was definitely more crowded. So I, okay. I have a feeling it was full every night and we booked both maybe, maybe three to four, four months in advance. Um, Taos Montebello is another one where you don't book online. I think you actually had to call maybe, or maybe you sent something in and they called you. Um, but I did talk to them on the phone when booking and I said, hey, I just really want to view, just like I had said to Santa Fe Skies. And they were very accommodating and they're like, yep, you'll be happy with the view here. And he was right. Um, I think almost all of the campsites there probably have a pretty good view, but um, yeah, we really liked by the way, if you want it to be a sunset competition between campgrounds, <laughs> you can do that as an yeah. RV owner, right? If that's what if that's what matters to you, yeah. um, I like the fact you have to call. I don't know. Yeah. I, I moving everything to online booking too is very convenient, very easy. I do it a lot myself, particularly if I know the campground. Uh, but sometimes it's nice to call and ask some questions and and help get the exact site you want. Did you, when you called, did you tell them that you were doing a sunset competition and that you <laughs> wanted the best possible sunset? And that, I mean, I know you're, you're like right. me. You want to be a ninja right. and get the yeah. exact site that you want. You want the best site. Uh, did you have that conversation? 
I didn't, but I did mention that I was coming from the from the Midwest. So I, I wanted them to understand that this was an experience for me aside from just camping there. Like your local people who live in New Mexico are coming there. It's not a big deal. That's where they live. But for me, being in that environment was a little bit special part of the deal. So, I love that yeah. angle and that approach. Like I'm going to yeah. try that. Like, hey, I'm from New Jersey <laughs> and your state's really beautiful yeah. and you better give me the best site possible. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, but I, I love New Jersey. Yeah, and I totally think like that owner, if you just like, he would even, the, he and his wife would drive through the campground at night and talk to you. Like, seriously, if you needed to know anything about Taos, they they um, seem like they love that this is what they get to do. And they really seem to enjoy welcoming people to, to Taos and to their campground. So hope to see them like succeeding and, and doing well. It, it's a really beautiful, special place. So you did chill and relax back at the campground in the evenings and spend some evenings there? Yeah. So that was part of our strategic planning. And spending five days was not to hustle and bustle all day. So we had lazy mornings, went out and did stuff through the middle of the day, and then came back for lazy evenings most of the time. So it was kind of a nice break from my normal pace (laughs) because sometimes I'm an over planner. So I'm trying to get better at that, making sure to build in actual relaxation time love it okay anything else on the campground which sounds phenomenal i would definitely stay here myself or do you want to move into some awesome restaurants that you guys tried out yeah i think ready to oh one rest one campground that i should mention there's a place um called i think it was called mm, house luna or something like that something to do with luna moon or sun or something but they rented out vintage trailers super adorable place took some pictures of it. So if you're, if you don't have an RV and can't stay at House Montebello, definitely look for this place called Lunar or Mystic Luna or something like that. Cause they have Airstreams, vintage trailers, um, adorable, adorable looking place. And it was just down the road from where we were. And that is booming right now. I can't even keep up with all of that. And I'm trying to actually, you know, like I can't even keep up with all these new places that are popping up that are either kind of glamping centric or renting classic you know, airstreams or whatever it might be. I, I love seeing that whole landscape develop for people who don't uh, own an RV but might want to stay in an RV. I think yeah. that's fantastic. Uh, okay, so let's talk food. Like, what did you yeah. guys discover here in Taos? What did you love? So, New Mexico is famous uh, mostly for its chilies. If you go, you can order green chili, red chili. Um, we are we are like total Midwesterners, so we weren't um, up for the red chili yet. They also serve it like Christmas style where you could get red and green mix. So it's a big deal. That being said, we didn't eat a ton of straight up New Mexico, New Mexican cuisine because we had had some in Santa Fe and some here. So my first place is actually not even um, that style of cuisine, but it was the Taos Mesa Brewing Company. And they had wood fired pizzas. And oh my gosh, everything on the menu sounded so good. I think I was starving, of course, when we got there, but like, I could have ordered three appetizers, the pizza and the salad, and probably just kept trying things because the menu was that, you know, unique kind of fun stuff that you want to, you want to try. So pizza was great. Um, They had like four or five different kind of um, cider ales and um, other good looking things on tap and could do, um, the name just fell out of my, (laughs) where you get several different ones to try. Flight. Right. There you go. So I had a very small flight, had a honey ginger beer that was very good. So that was you guys, And you guys like to do a brewery, too, when you yeah. travel, right? So you're yeah. not, I mean, if you went to more of the local cuisine, you might not have had that that brewery yeah. aspect to it or had all those nice beers there to try. Yeah. Uh, all right. What else did you try? You have a couple more good places. I may mispronounce this, too. Saber Real or Saber Real. That's the um, chef's last name. Um, Saber Real Restaurant. And this place was really close to downtown, felt very local, and did have New Mexican cuisine. Uh, We were there at breakfast, and so I ordered an omelet, and I was kind of surprised because they asked me what kind of tortillas I like. Never in my life, like this is the dumbest thing, never in my life have I ordered an omelet and thought to put that into a tortilla and make my own baby breakfast burritos, but it was so good. Um, Russell had their breakfast burrito. It was super good and just felt very local. They had a beautiful dessert case and again, very friendly, very friendly people. And for both of these places so far, we're, we're talking downtown or were they more you know, yeah. closer to the campground? Yeah, both of those are um, downtown. Now, Taos Mesa does have a tap room very close to the campground, probably like five minutes from it. 
it didn't look like that one had the food though. So like if you were just going for the beer, they also had live entertainment out there. Um, but there's another location close to downtown that had the food. Okay. You got one more pick for us. One more. You got to have ice cream when you're on vacation. Generally, when we were traveling in nice in national parks, it seemed like 3.30 was our ice cream time. And um, I guess because we usually eat like twice a day. We eat like a, a, a breakfast or a breakfast brunch kind of dinner and then a dinner. So anyway, my, my 3.30 ice cream did not disappoint in Taos. So it's called, we went to a place called Taos Cow, not actually in Taos, but um, just very close to the campground, 10 to 15 minutes up the road in a charming little town called Aurora Seco. And um, they advertise having natural and just really unique flavors. I went because I saw online that they had coconut ice cream. They did not have it the day we went, um, but I had something with like cherries and pinion nuts that was really good and everything looked good. They also have, I think, bagels and some other um, light foods. But what we thought was really cool is out back, they had a creek and um, like a bunch of willow trees and all of these kids were just like jumping over that creek. And it just made me think about how, especially when we go to campgrounds, like you can put in a, you know, 10, $20,000 playground or whatever. But if you have like a creek and a hill or like big rocks, <laughs> like that is all the entertainment that kids need. Like the kids are just jumping back and forth. The little girl had her, her ice cream in her hand. Of course, Russell's like, she's going to lose that. And of course, like five minutes later, she did. But her parents were like, she's probably had enough of the ice cream. So that was fine. But yeah, it was just one of those places where everybody was just hanging out. Kids were jumping and playing. They did not care about the ice cream. They were having fun. Sounds like a classic summer spot and a classic yeah. summer moment. Now, you said that you got to have ice cream when you're traveling or on an RV trip. But you just have to have ice cream when it's summer. Yeah. Okay, so everybody listening to this podcast, you know, it's yeah. summer right now. If you have not been having ice cream, you need to go out and get some ice cream. Yeah. Uh, okay, those were three awesome restaurants. This is great. This sounds like such a wonderful, wonderful city, such a wonderful, wonderful trip. Now you did, this was your second time to Santa Fe uh, because you wanted to do some things you didn't do. Do you, is Taos a place you would return to in the future? Yeah, like it's definitely the kind of place where, again, if you're, going just to hang out and just relax and go and eat some good food and stroll through some galleries definitely would do that again totally awesome all right we're going to come back in a second to wrap up the show with carrie cox from travels with birdie but before we do so we have a sponsored message from our friends at yogi bears jellystone park camp resorts welcome back to the show everybody we are wrapping up a two-part series on carrie cox's awesome new mexico road trip um, Carrie, this sounds like it was a really, really like five star trip for you guys. Um, was it better than you expected? Totally. Yeah. I was um not sure, you know, that it was gonna have the nice pool environment and everything that I like in the summer, and it totally was. I, natural beauty, fun things to eat and see. So loved it. Totally. <laughs> All right. So what's on you, you know, you you have been really great at doing these bucket list trips every summer and you know, uh, you, you inspire me too to, to get out West. So what's, you know, what's on the bucket list for you guys now, particularly maybe that you're doing some of these trips without the kids and the, cause they're working in the summer and college and all that stuff. So what's on the bucket list for the next couple of summers? I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward to hopefully getting the content out of you too, <laughs> yeah. for goodness sake. Hey, it's kind of hard to say like our big bucket list, we really want to do the Pacific Northwest, but I am kind of like, needing two or three months there because I want to do like Vancouver to Northern California. And so we're still juggle juggling around being home for the kids and being away and all of that. So, and then Vermont is our other place and it's also so far. So we, we've got to investigate uh, Great Lakes. We haven't done yet. I think they might be a too hot and buggy for me in the summer, but we're, we're, we're thinking so. But probably definitely go back to the mountains. There's still areas of Colorado that I haven't done, um, particularly Ure, um, Silverton, Durango, that area. So um, Russell doesn't, you know, he he um, is ready for me to get to the end of my Colorado bucket list because he tells me there is more to see in the world. But <laughs> my heart gets Well, you, you, I mean, we've been to Vermont the past two summers in a row, and it's becoming a tradition because we have friends up there. And, we, and we've been three other times to Vermont. So we're like five trips to Vermont in. And it's, it is a fantastic state for camping. 
fantastic state in the summer. There's so many waterfalls, so many swimming holes, so much cliff jumping, so many independent <laughs> bookstores, so much coffee, so much good food. Yeah. I mean, so if you guys, you know, if you pull off Vermont next summer, let us know because we <laughs> typically have been going once a summer and would love to catch up with you there. And I, I would definitely move that to the top over returning to Colorado, if not that you were asking yeah. for my advice. <laughs> yeah. And then the Pacific Northwest, I, I get that yeah. desire to have this massive road trip. I mean, we did 26 or 28 days in the Pacific Northwest, but I would encourage you to maybe break it into a couple trips like you've done with yeah. Colorado, right? You don't have to do all of it in, in one shot. Yeah. And a Vermont, Pacific Northwest, um, two amazing places. I would look forward to seeing what campgrounds you select and doing some podcasts on those locations. So uh, where can everybody follow you online and on social media? Sure. I am at Travels with Birdie. Um, that's my blog, travelswithbirdie.com. And then I have um, Instagram and uh, Facebook and um, all under that. So mostly active on Instagram. Carrie Cox, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for coming on the show for about nine years worth of awesome content. We appreciate (laughs) you so much. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. Love to talk about all of these places and love to hear from all of the people you have on to tell me about more wonderful places. Yeah. And enjoy the rest of your summer. You too. Take care. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of the RV Atlas. To find out more about the topics discussed on this show, head on over to the RVAtlas.com. And to join the friendliest group of RVers, head on over to the RV Atlas group on Facebook and make sure to join us on YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram at the RV Atlas. If you enjoy our show, please consider leaving us a review over on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. And we will see you at the campground. See you at the campground.